Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Star, and Chloe and Bella. As always, I want to you to please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And without further ado, we're going to get into the next installment of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, and let's get there. Okay, we're back on to Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. Today we're going to be finishing up on the first part of the book, which is, there was uh, part one, the Pet Cemetery. I didn't mention that in the beginning, but, so, and we're finishing that up, and the next part will be the Nick Micmac Burying Ground, up, but that will start in the next video. And without further ado, start at chapter 33. For man and woman, it is like the flowers in the valley which bloom today and are tomorrow cast into the oven. The time of man is but a season, it cometh, and so it passeth away, let us pray. Ellie, resplendent in a navy blue dress, bought especially for the occasion, dropped her head so abruptly that Louis, sitting next to her in the pew, heard her neck creak. Ellie had been in few churches. Of course, it was her first funeral. The combination had awed her to unaccustomed silence. For Lewis, it had been a rare, rare occasion with his daughter, mostly blinded by his love for her, as he was by his love for Gage. He rarely observed her in a detached way, but today he thought he was seeing what was almost the textbook case of the child nearing the end of life's first great developmental, developmental stage, an organism of almost pure curiosity, storing up information madly in almost endless circuits. Ellie had been... Quiet, even when Judd looking strange but elegant in his black suit and lace-up shoes. Lewis believed it was the first time he had ever seen him in anything but loafers or green rubber boots. Had bent over, kissed her, and said, Glad you could come, honey, and I bet Norma is too. Elliot gazed at him wide-eyed. Now the Methodist minister, Reverend Laughlin, was pronouncing the benediction, asking God to lift up his countenance upon them and give them peace. Will the pallbearers come forward, he asked. Lewis started to rise, and Ellie halted him, rugging, tugging his arm. Frantically, she looked scared. Daddy, she stage whispered, where are you going? I'm one of the pallbearers, honey. Oh, close over the messing around. Lewis said, sitting down beside her again for a moment and putting an arm around her shoulders. That means I'm going to help carry Norma out. There are four of us that are going to do it, me and two of Judd's nephews and Norma's brother. Where will I find you? Lewis glanced down front. The other three pallbearers had assembled there, along with Judd. The rest of the congregation was filing out, some of them weeping. If you just go out on the steps, I'll meet you there, he said. All right, Ellie? Yes, she said. Just don't forget me. No, I won't. He got up again, and she tugged his hand again. Daddy? What, babe? Don't drop her, Ellie whispered. Lewis joined the others, and Judd introduced him to the nephews, who were really second or third cousins, descendants of Judd's father's brother. They were big fellows in their twenties with a strong facial resemblance. Norma's brother was somewhere in his late fifties, Lewis guessed, and while the strain of a death in the family was on his face, he seemed to be bearing up well. Pleased to meet you all, Lewis said. He felt a trifle un uncomfortable, an outsider in the family circle. They nodded at him. Ellie okay? Judd asked and nodded to her. She was lingering up in the vestibule watching. Sure, she just wants to make sure I don't go up in a puff of smoke, Lewis thought, and almost smiled. But then that thought called up another one. Oh, is the great and terrible, and the smile died. Yes, I think so, Lewis said, and raised a hand to her. She raised hers in return and went outside, then in a swirl, swirl of navy blue dress. For a moment, Lewis was uneasily struck by how adult she looked. It was a sort of illusion, no matter how fleeting, that could give a man pause. You guys ready? One of the nephews asked. Lewis nodded, so did Norma's younger brother. Take it easy with her, Judd said, his voice had roughened. Then he turned away and walked slowly up the aisle with his head down. Lewis moved up to the back left corner of the steel gray American internal coffin, tried to chosen for his wife. He laid hold of his runner, and the four of them slowly carried Norma's coffin out into the bright, still, cold February 1st. Someone, the church, 
custodian. He supposed had laid down a good bed of cinders over the slippery path of tamped snow. At the curb of a Cadillac hearse, a Cadillac hearse idled while, excuse me, white exhaust into the winter air. The funeral director and his husky son stood beside it, watching them, ready to lend a hint if anyone, her brother, perhaps should slip her flag. Judge stood beside him and watched as they slid the coffin inside. Goodbye, Norma, he said, and lit a cigarette. I'll see you in a while, old girl. Lewis slipped an arm around Judge's shoulders, and Norma's brother stood close by on his other side, crowding the mortician and his son into the background. The burly nephews, or second cousins, or whatever they were, had already done a fade, the simple job of lifting and carrying done. They had grown distant from this part of the family. They had known the woman's face from photographs, and a few duty visits, perhaps, long afternoons spent in the parlor eating Norma's cookies and drinking Judd's beer, perhaps not really minding the old stories of times they had not lived through and people they had not known, but aware of things they could have been doing all the same. A car that could have been washed and turtle waxed, a league bowling practice, maybe just sitting around the TV and watching a boxing match with some friends and glad to be away when the duty was done. Judd's part of the family was in the past now, as far as they were concerned. It was like an extended, excuse me, it was like an eroded planetoid drifting away from the main mass. Dwindling little more than a speck, the past, pictures in an album, old stories told in rooms that perhaps seemed to, too hot to them. They were not old. There was no arthritis in their joints. Their blood had not thinned. The past was runners to be gripped and hefted and later got, let go. After all, if the human body was an envelope to hold the human soul, God's letters to this universe, as much, most churches taught, then the American eternal coffin was an envelope to hold the human body, and to these husky young cousins or nephews or whatever they were, the past was just a dead letter to be filed away. God saved the past, Lewis thought, and shivered for no good reason. Other than that, the duty would come when he would be every bit unfamiliar to his own blood, his own grandchildren of Ellier, Gage produced kids, and he lived to see them. The focus shifted, family lines degenerated, young faces looking out of old photographs. God saved the past, he thought again, and tightened his grip around the old man's shoulders. The ushers put the flowers into the back of the hearse. The electric rear window rose and thumped home in its socket. Lewis went back to where his daughter was, and they walked to the station wagon together, Lewis holding Ellie's arm so she wouldn't slip in her good shoes with the leather soles. Car engines were starting up. Why are they putting on their lights, Daddy? Ellie asked with mild wonder. Why are they putting on their lights in the middle of the day? They do it, Lewis began, and heard the thickness in his voice, in his own voice, to honor the dead, Ellie. He pulled out the knob that turned on the wagon's headlights. Come on, they were going home at last, the graveside ceremony over. Actually, it was held at the small Mount Hope Chapel. No grave would be dug for Norma until spring, when Ellie suddenly burst into tears. Lewis glanced at her surprise, but not particularly alarmed. Ellie, what is it? No more cookies, Ellie sob sobbed. She made the best oatmeal cookies I ever ate, but she won't make them anymore because she's dead, Daddy. Why do people have to be dead? I don't really know, Lewis said. To make room for all the new people, I guess. Little people like you and your brother, Gage. I'm never going to get married or do sex and have babies, Ellie declared, crying harder than ever. Then maybe it'll never happen to me. It's awful. It's my, my, my meme. But it's an end to suffering, Lewis said quietly. And as a doctor, I see a lot of suffering. One of the reasons I wanted the job at the university was because I got sick of looking at it day in and day out. Young people quite often have pain, bad pain even, but that's not quite the same as suffering. He paused. Believe it or not, honey... When people get very old, death doesn't always look so bad or so scary as it seems to you. And you have years and years and years ahead of you. Ellie cried, and then she snipped, and then she stopped. Before they got home, she asked if she could play the radio. Lewis said yes, and she found Shaken Stephen singing this old house on W-A-C-Z. Soon she was singing along. When they got home, she went to her mother and prattled about the funeral, to Rachel's credit. She listened quietly, sympathetically, and supportively, although Lewis thought she looked pale and thoughtful. Then Ellie asked if she knew how to make oatmeal cookies, and Rachel put away the piece of knitting she'd been doing and rose at once as if she'd been waiting for this or something like this. Like it? Yes, she said. Want to make a batch? Yay! Ellie shouted, Can we really, Mom? We can if your father will watch Gage for an hour. 
I'll watch him, Lewis said, with pleasure. Lewis spent the evening reading and making notes in a long article in the <clears throat> Duquesne Medical Digest. Duquesne, Duquesne, something like that. The old controversy concerning dissolving sutures had begun again. In the small world of those relatively few humans on earth concerned with stitching minor wounds, it appeared to be as endless as the old psycho psychological squabbling point, nature versus n nurture. He intended writing a dissenting letter this very night, proving that the writer's main contentions were spacious, his case examples self-serving, his research almost criminally sloppy. In short, Lewis was looking forward with good heat with high good humor to blowing the stupid fuck right off the map. He was hunting around in the study bookcase for his copy of Troutman's treatment of wounds when Rachel came halfway down the stairs. Coming up, Lewis, I'll be a while, he glanced up at her. Everything all right? They're deep asleep, both of them. Lewis looked at her closely. Them, yeah, you are not. I'm fine, been reading. You're okay, really? Yes, she said and smiled. I love you, Lewis. Love you too, babe. He glanced at the bookcase and there was Troutman, right where he had been all along. Lewis put his hand on the textbook. Church brought a rat into the house while you and Ellie were gone, she said. Tried to smile. Smile. Yuck, what a mess. Jeez, Rachel, I'm sorry. He hoped he did not sound as guilty as that m moment he felt. It was bad. Rachel sat down on the stairs in a pink flannel nightgown, her face cleaned of makeup and her forehead shining, her hair tied back into a short ponytail with a rubber band. She sh looked like a child. I took care of it, she said, but do you know... I had to beat the dumb, that dumb cat out the door with the vacuum cleaner attachment before it would stop guarding the, the corpse. It growled at me. Church never growled at me before in his life. He seems different lately. Do you think he might have distemper or something, Lou? No, Lewis said slowly, but I'll take him to the vet if you want. I guess it's all right, she said. Then looked at him nakedly. But would you come up? I just, I know you're working, but of course, he said, getting up as though it were nothing important at all. And really it wasn't, except he knew that now the letter would be never be written because the parade has a way of moving on. Tomorrow would bring something new, but he had brought bought that rat Adney. The rat the church had bought in surely clawed bloody ribbons. Its intestines dragging, its head perhaps gone. Yes, he had bought it. It was his rat. Let's go to bed, he said, turning off the lights. He and Rachel went up the stairs together. Lewis put his arm around her waist and looked and loved her the best he could, but even as he entered into her, hard and erect, he was listening to the winter whine outside the front trace of windows, wondering about church, the cat that used to belong to his daughter now belonged to him, wondering where it was and what it was stalking or killing. The soil of a man's heart is stonier, he thought, and the wind sang in it its bitter black song, and not so many miles distant, Norma Crandall had once knitted his daughter and son matching caps, lay in her gray steel American eternal coffin on a stone slab in a Mount Hope's crypt. By now, the white cotton the mortician would have used to suffer cheeks would be turning black. Ooh. Chapter 34 That's a short chapter. Ellie turned six. She came home from kindergarten on her birthday with a paper hat askew on her head. Several pictures friends had drawn of her, and the best of them Ellie looked like a friendly scarecrow and baleful stories about spankings in the schoolyard during recess. The flu ep epidemic passed. They had to send two students to the EMMC in Bangor and surrender a heart who probably saved the life of one woefully sick freshman boy with the terrible name of Peter Humperton who went into convulsions shortly after being admitted. Rachel developed a mild infatuation with the blonde bag boy at the A&P in Brewer and rhapsodized to Lewis at night how he packed his jeans how packed his jeans looked. It's probably just toilet paper, she added. Squeeze it sometime, Lewis suggested. If he screamed, it's probably not. Rachel had laughed until she cried. The blue still sub-zero mini-season of February passed and brought on the alternating rains and <clears throat> freezes of March, potholes and those orange roadside signs which pay homage to the great god. Bump. The immediate personal and m most agonizing grief of Judd Crandall passed, that grief which the psychologists say begins about three days after the death of a loved one holds hard from four to six weeks in most cases. Like that period of time, New England is sometimes called deep winter, but time passes and time welds one state of human feeling into another until they become something like a rainbow. Strong grief becomes a softer, more mellow grief. Mellow grief becomes mourning. 
Mourning at last becomes remembrance, a process that may take from six months to three years and still be considered normal. The day of Gage's first haircut came and passed, and when Lewis saw his son's hair growing and darker, and darker he joked about it and did his own mourning, but only in his heart. Spring came, and it stayed a while. And that's the end of chapter 34. We're on to chapter 35. That was a shorty. <clears throat> Lewis Creed came to believe that the last really happy day of his life was March 24th, 1984. The things that would have come poised above them like a killing sash weight were still over seven weeks in the future, but looking over those seven weeks, he found nothing which stood out with the same color. He supposed that even if none of those things, terrible things had happened, he would have remembered the day forever. Days would seem genuinely good, good all the way through, a rare enough anyway, he thought. It might be <clears throat> that there was less than a month of really good ones in any natural man's life in the best of circumstances. It came to seem it came to seem to Lewis that God in his infinite wisdom seemed much more generous when it came to doling out pain. That day was a Saturday and he was home mind engaged in, in the afternoon while Rachel and Ellie went after groceries. They had gone with Judd in his old and rattling fifty nine IH pickup, not because the station wagon wasn't running, but because the old man genuinely liked their company. Rachel asked Lewis if he would be okay with Gage, and he told her that of course he would. He was glad to see her get out. After a winter in Maine, most of it in Ludlow, he thought that she needed all the getting out she could lay her hands on. She had been an unremittingly good sport about it, but she did seem to <clears throat> him to be getting a little stir-crazy. Gage got up from his nap around two o'clock, scratching and out of sorts. He had discovered the terrible twos and made them his own. <clears throat> Lewis tried several ineffectual gambits to amuse the kid, and Gage turned them all down. To make matters worse, the rotten kid had an enormous bowel movement, the artistic quality of which was not improved for Lewis when he saw a blue marble sitting in the middle of it. It was one of Ellie's marbles. The kid could have choked. He decided the marbles were going to go. Everything Gage got hold of went right to his mouth. But that decision, while undoubtedly laudable, didn't do a thing about keeping the kid amused until his mother got back. Lewis listened to the early spring wind gust around the house, sending big blinkers of light and shadow across Miss. Miss Vinton's field next door, and he suddenly thought of the vulture he had bought on a whim five or six years before, while on his way home from the university. Had he bought twine as well? He had, by God. Gage, he said. Gage had found a green cradle under the couch and was currently scribbling in one of Ellie's favorite books. Something else to feed the fires of sibling rivalry, Lewis thought, and grinned. If Ellie got really pissy about the scribbles Gage had managed to put in where the wild things are before Lewis could get it away from him, Lewis would simply mention the unique treasure he had uncovered in Gage's pampers. What? Gage responded smartly. He was taking pre talking pretty well now. Lewis had decided the kid might actually be half bright. You want to go out? Want to go out? Gage agreed excitedly. Want to go out? Where my neeks, Daddy? This sentence, if produced phonetically, would have looked something like this. Where my neeks, Daddy? <laughs> the translation was, where are my sneakers, Father? Lewis was often struck by Gage's speech. Not because it was cute, but because he thought that small children all sounded like immigrants learning a foreign language in some helter-skelter but fairly amiable way. He knew that babies <clears throat> make all the sounds the human voice box is capable of, the liquid trill that proves so difficult for first-year French students, the glottal grunts and clicks of the Australian bush people, the thickened, abrupt consonants of German. They lose the capabilities they learn English, and Lewis wondered now, and not for the first time, a childhood was not more a period of forgetting than of learning. Gage's neeks were finally found. They were also under the couch. One of Lewis's other beliefs was that in families with small children, the area under living room couches begin, begins after a while to develop a strong and mysterious electromagnetic force that eventually sucks in all sorts of litter. Everything from bottles and diaper pins to green crayolas and old issues of Sesame Street magazine with food moldering between the pages. Gage's jacket, however, wasn't under the couch. It was halfway down the stairs, his Red Sox cap, without, with Ga without which Gage refused to leave the house, was the most difficult of all to find, because it was where it belonged, in the closet. That was naturally the last place they looked. We're going, Daddy, Gage almost companionably giving his, his father his hand. 
Gage asked companionably, giving his father's hand. Going over in Mrs. Vinton's field, he said. Gonna fly a kite, my man. Kite, Gage asked doubtfully. You'll like it, Lewis said. Wait a minute, kiddo. They were in the garage now. Lewis found his key ring, unlocked the little storage closet, and turned on the light. He rummaged through the closet and found the vulture, still in its store bag with a sales slip stapled to it. He had bought it in the depths of mid-February when his soul had cried up with some hope. Dat? Gage asked. This was Gage East for whatever in the world might you have there, father. It's the kite, Lewis said, and pulled it out of the bag. Gage watched, interested, as Lewis unfurled the vulture, which spread its wings over perhaps five feet of tough plastic, its bulgy blood shot eyes staring out at them from its small head atop its scrawny pinky naked yell uh, pinky naked pinkly naked neck. Bert Gage yelled, Bert, Daddy, get a, got a Bert. Yeah, it's a bird, Lewis agreed, slipping the sticks into the pockets of the back of the kite and rummaging again for the five hundred feet of kite twine that he had bought the same day. He looked back over his shoulder and repeated to, Ga repeated to Gage, You're gonna like it, big guy. Gage liked it. They took the kite over to Mrs. Vinton's field, and Lewis got it up into the blowy late March sky for a shot. Though, although he had not flown a kite since he was, what, 12, 19 years ago. God, that was ter horrible. Mrs. Vinton was a woman of almost Judd's age, but immeasurably more frail. She lived in a br brick house at the head of her field, but now she came out only rarely. Behind the house, the field ended and the woods began. The woods that led first to Pet Cemetery. And then to the Micmac burying ground beyond it. Kites flying, Daddy, Gage screamed. Yeah, look at it go, Lewis bellowed back, laughing and excited. He paid out. He kite twined so fast that the string grew hot and branded in thin fire across his palm. Look at that vulture, Gage. She's going to beat shit. Beat shit, Gage cried and laughed. High and joyously, the sun sh sailed up from behind a fat gray spring cloud, and the temperature seemed to go up five degrees almost at once. They stood in the bright, unreliable warmth of March, straining to be April in the high, dead grass of Mrs. Vinton's field. Above them, the vultures soared up toward the, toward the blue, higher its plastic, blue higher its plastic wings spread taut against the, that steady current of air. Still higher, and as he had done as a child, Lewis felt himself going up to it, going into it, staring down as the world took on its actual shape. The one cartographers must see in their dreams. Mrs. Vinton's field is white and still as cobwebs, following the retreat of the snow. Not just a field now, but a large parallelogram, bounded by rock walls on two of their sides. On its sides. And then the road at, at the bottom. A straight black seam in the river valley, the vulture saw it all with its soaring, bloodshot eyes. It saw the river like a cool gray band of steel, chunks of ice still floating in it. On the other side, it was saw Hamden, Newburgh, Winterport, with a ship at a, do a dock. Perhaps it saw the St. Regis Mill at Bucksport. Below its streaming fume of cloud, or even lands end itself with the Atlantic pounded the naked rock. Look at her go, Gage. Lewis yelled, laughing. Gage was leaning so far back. He was in danger of toppling over. A huge grin covering his face, covered his face. He was waving to the kite. Lewis got some slack and told Gage to hold out one of his hands. Gage did, not even looking around. He couldn't take his eyes from the kite, which swung and danced in the wind and raced its shadow back and forth across the field. Lewis wound the kite string twice around Gage's hand, and now he did look, comically amazed at the Strong tug and pull. What, he said. You're flying it, Lewis said. You got the hammer, my man. It's your kite. Gage, flying it, Gage said, as if asking not his father but himself for confirmation. He pulled the string experimentally. The kite nodded in the windy sky. Gage pulled the string harder. The kite swooped. Lewis and his son laughed together. Gage reached out his free hand, groping, and Lewis took it in his own. They stood together that way in the middle of Mrs. Vinton's field, looking up at the vulture. It was a moment with his son that Lewis never forgot. As he had gone up and in, up and into the kite as a child himself, he saw he now found himself going into Gage, his son. He felt himself shrink until he was within Gage's tiny house, looking out of the windows that were his eyes, looking out at a, a world that was now so huge and bright, a world where Mrs. Vinton's field was nearly as big as the Bondsville salt flats. With a kite, Soared miles above him, the strong, the string drumming, 
in his fist like a live thing as the w wind blew around him, tumbling his hair. Kite flying, Gage cried out to his father. Lewis put his <clears throat> arm around Gage's shoulders and kissed the boy's cheek, in which the wind had bloomed a wild rose. I love you, Gage, he said. It was between the two of them, and that was all right. And Gage, who now had less than two months to live, laughed shrilly and joyously. Kite flying, kite flying, Daddy. They were still flying the kite where Rachel and Ellie, when Rachel and Ellie came home, he and Gage had gotten it so high that they had nearly turned, run out the string and the face of the vulture had been lost. It was only a small black silhouette in the sky. Lewis was glad to see the two of them, and he roared with laughter when Ellie dropped the string momentarily and chased it through the grass, catching it just before the tumbling, unraveling cord tube gave up the last of its twine. But having them... Around also changed things a little, and he was not terribly sorry to go in when, twenty minutes later, Rachel said she believed Gage had had enough of the wind. She was afraid he would get a chill. So the kite was pulled back in, fighting for the sky at every turn of the twine, at last surrendering. Lewis tucked it, black wings, buggy blot, bloodshot eyes and all, under his arms, and imprisoned it in the st storage closet again. That night, Gage ate an enormous supper of hot dogs and beans. While Rachel was dressing him in his Dr. Denton's for bed, Lewis took Ellie aside and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her about leaving her marbles around. Under other circumstances, he might have ended up shouting at her because Ellie could turn quite haughty, insulting even, when accused of some mistake. It was only her way of dealing with criticism. But that did not keep in from infuriating Lewis when she laid it on too thick or when he was particularly tired. But this night, the kite flying had left him in a fine mood, and Ellie was inclined to be reasonable. She agreed to be more careful and then went downstairs to watch TV until 8.30, a Saturday indulgence she treasured. Okay, that's out of the way, and it might even do some good, Lewis thought, not knowing that marbles were really not the problem, and chills were really not the problem. That large Rinko truck was going to be the problem, but the road was going to be the problem, as Judd Crandall had warned them it might be on that first day of August. He went upstairs at night about 15 minutes after Gage had been put to bed. He found his son quiet but still awake, drinking the last of a bottle of milk, and looking contemptibly, contemptibly up at the ceiling. Lewis took one of Gage's feet in one hand and raised it up. He kissed it, lowered it. Good night, Gage, he said. Kite flying, Daddy, Gage said. You really did fly, didn't it, Lewis said. And for no reason at all, felt tears behind his eyes. Right up to the sky, my man. Kite flying, Gage said. Up to the, to the sky. He rolled over on his side, closed his eyes, and slept just like that. Lewis was stepping into the hall when he glanced back and saw yellowy, green, disembodied eyes staring out at him from Gage's closet. The closet door was open, just a crack. His heart took a lurch into his throat, and his mouth pulled back and down in a grimace. He opened the closet door, thinking, Zelda, it's Zelda in the closet, her black tongue puffing out between her lips. He wasn't sure what, but of course it was only church. The cat was in the closet, and when he saw Lewis, it, ar when he saw Lewis, it arched its back like a cat. On a Halloween card, it hissed at him, its mouth partly open, revealing its needle-sharp teeth. Get out of there, Lewis whispered. Church hissed. It did not move. Get out, I said. He picked up the first thing that came to hand in the litter of Gage's toys, a bright plastic, chuggy, chuggy, choo-choo, which in this dim light was the maroon color of dried blood. He brandished it at church. The cat not only stood its ground, but hissed again. And suddenly, without even thinking, Lewis threw the toy at the cat, not playing, not goofing around. He pegged the toy at the cat. As hard as he could, furious at it and scared of it too, that it should hide in there in the darkened closet of his son's room and refu refused to leave, as if it had a right to be there. The toy locomotive struck the cat dead center. Church uttered a squawk and fled, displaying its usual grace by slamming into the door and almost falling over on its way out. Gage stirred, muttered something, shifted position, and was still again. Lewis felt a little sick. There was sweat standing out in beads on his forehead. Lewis, Rachel from downstairs, sounding alarm. Did Gage fall out of his crib? He's fine, honey. Church knocked over a couple of his toys. Oh, all right. He felt irrationally or otherwise the way he might have felt if he had looked in on his son and found a snake crawling over him or a big rat perched on the bookshelf of Gage's crib. Of course, it was irrational. But when it had hissed at him from the closet like that, Zelda, did you think Zelda, did you think Oz the Great and Terrible? He closed his... Gage's closet door, sweeping a number of toys back in, it w in with its moving f foot. He listened to the tiny 
click of the latch. After a moment's further hesitation, he turned the closet's thumb bolt. He went back to Gage's crib. Shifting around, the kid had kicked his two blankets down around his knees. Lewis disentangled him, pulled the blankets up, and then merely stood there watching his son for a long time. It's the end of part one and the end of chapter... <laughs> chapter something. Chapter 35. In the next video, we will get into... This is short of a video in some of them. We'll get into part two, the Micmac Burying Ground, and start off on chapter 36. But if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell, and stay tuned for more. Okay, and you have a nice night.